John chapter 11, Jesus learned that a dear friend of his named Lazarus was sick, and then he learned, or Jesus knew it before he had even been told of it publicly, that Lazarus had died. And Jesus waited in the place where he heard of this news for two extra days before he came to do anything about the problem. By the time he came to Bethany, the place where Lazarus and his two sisters, Mary and Martha, lived, by the time he got there, Lazarus had been buried or had been put in that tomb for four days. But Jesus came to be a comfort to Martha, to be a comfort to Mary. Nobody expected that Jesus was going to do what we're going to see him do later on in this chapter. So Jesus initially spoke with Martha. And Martha poured out her heart. She poured out her disappointment to Jesus. She was genuinely disappointed that Jesus did not come earlier to heal her brother. Now that he was dead, she considered that it was too far gone and that, yes, Jesus would raise her brother from the dead on the last day, but for now he was dead and gone. Then Martha brought Mary, her sister, into the situation. That's where we pick it up at verse 28. We read, And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary, her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews, who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now, I think it's interesting that she repeated the same phrase that her sister Martha had saw that we saw last week. Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. The sisters must have talked about this. If only Jesus would have come sooner. If only Jesus would not have delayed. And I don't know how many of you have ever said something like that. But they said, it could have done something about that then, but there's nothing to do about it now. But before I move on to the next verses, I want to call your attention to something in verse 28 that sort of strikes my eye. It's how Martha referred to Jesus to Mary. It says right there in verse 28, the teacher has come. That's how they talked about Jesus. When Martha said, the teacher, Mary immediately knew that she spoke about Jesus. Isn't that kind of wonderful? Because number one, notice this, to them, he was the teacher. Oh, I suppose they might have had many teachers in their life, but no, there was one who was the teacher, Jesus. Secondly, I want you to notice this, that a woman in that culture called Jesus her teacher. Rabbis didn't teach women in those days, but Jesus did. Jesus taught these women, and they could say, he's the teacher, he's our teacher, he's my teacher. Now, friends, let me just draw a quick point of application before we move on to verse 33. It's simply this, you need a teacher. You may not know that, but you need somebody to be a guide for your life. You need someone greater than you are to speak wisdom and power and guidance and transformation in your life. Something you're not going to find in a self-help book. Something you're not going to get even through the best mentoring relationship you might have on a human level. You need Jesus to be the teacher in your life. Now going on here, verse 33. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and the stone lay against it. Friends, I hope that as I read those verses, verses 33 through 38, I hope it was like a movie running in your mind. Can you picture the scene? There's Jesus some distance away from the tomb. He's met Mary, and Mary's face has that crying face kind of look to it. Someone who's almost exhausted from so many tears. You've got mourners around, some of them genuine, some of them uh, hired. You've got this scene of very demonstrable mourning. Jesus comes to that scene, and look at what it says there in verse 33. It says, when Jesus saw her weeping. Now, uh, 
Jay's already told us how this story ends, so I'm not really giving a spoiler when I say Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Sorry to spoil the story for anybody here, but that's how it ends. Jesus knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Matter of fact, days before this, he told the disciples that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. I am very impressed that Jesus did not say to Mary or to Martha, what are you crying about? Just suck it up a little bit. I'm going to raise him from the dead. No. He saw her weeping and it moved Jesus. I wonder if you you think about this, that Jesus is so near in sympathy to the grieving person. Friends, I, I say this as somebody who sometimes feels Like when it comes to my life experience with these things, I'm a kindergartner. Let me explain why. Um, Bless the Lord, both my parents still live. Both Inga Lil's parents still live. We've never had an untimely death in our immediate family. Um, I, I, I don't know by experience what some of you have gone through. But I've been right next to you. I've seen what it's like. And can I just say, Jesus sees your tears of grief and he does not despise them. Jesus wants to draw near to you in your grief. Matter of fact, he identifies with it. Would you please look at verse 33 with me? It says, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled when jesus came to the scene of lazarus's tomb he groaned in the spirit the the original wording in the original biblical language is very interesting there it has the sense of jesus not only having pain that's why you would groan right oh but not only pain but also anger and indignation It's as if Jesus looks at the scene and he sees Lazarus dead in the tomb and he sees these grieving, weeping sisters and he thinks about the whole reign that the tyranny of death has held over mankind and he says, I'm not going to take this anymore. I'm going to serve notice. Matter of fact, I want you to notice that that phrase, he groaned in the spirit, it's used twice in these verses, in verse 33 and in verse 38. Jesus was doing something absolutely powerful here. Not only seeing and noting the weeping of the sisters, but identifying with them in it. So much so that look at verse 35, shortest verse in the Bible, two words. Jesus wept. He did not despise their tears of grief. He he was troubled and filled with a bit of anger and indignation, not at them for weeping, but at the tyranny that death holds over mankind. And then he wept, sharing in the grief of those who mourn. Do you know what it's like to share in somebody's grief? You you feel helpless, don't you? you? You feel like there's no words adequate to say. You, you hope that maybe by a show of compassion and care and just by your presence, maybe you can bring some soothing balm to, 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 the, to the pain that they feel. But you feel pretty helpless. This is what I want you to understand. Jesus was not helpless. He was going to fix this situation in just a few minutes. And he still wept. He still entered into their grief. But before he did anything about it, He shared in their grief and in their sorrow, just like it says in verse 35, Jesus wept. Friends, I just want you to understand, if the Son of God wept, there is no necessary shame in our tears. Let me tell you a reason why I feel it's important for me to say this. Sometimes I fear that in certain aspects of personality, that the congregation will become too much like me. Let me explain what I mean. I'm not a crier. I'm just not. Now, I I, I could tell you times where where I've I've wept, where I've sobbed. And, you know, if it was a very personal conversation, maybe I'd tell you about that. 
But by and large, I'm just not a crier. Just tears don't come easily to me. And it's not that I'm trying to fight them back. Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. No, I'm not doing that. It's just, it's just not easy for me. But I don't want anybody to think that that's more spiritual. Friends, that's purely my, like my quirk. Many times when I pray for somebody and they're crying, the first thing they say is, I'm sorry for crying. Dear brother, dear sister, don't be sorry. Your tears are precious before God. There is no necessary sin or shame in your tears. Jesus wept. Matter of fact, I would say if there's anything, it's often pride. It's often too lofty an opinion of ourselves that says, I'm not going to cry, I'm not going to cry. It's okay. God does not despise it at all. Jesus entered into that aspect of our humanity. Matter of fact, you could say that Jesus dignified the tears of others in the Bible who wept. Abraham wept, Jacob wept, David wept, Jonathan wept, Hezekiah wept, Joshua wept, Jeremiah wept. Jesus dignified their tears when he wept right alongside with them. Now I want you to notice what they said, I mean the onlookers when they saw Jesus weeping. Verse uh, 36 contains it. It says, see how he loved him. Do you get that? They see Jesus weeping and go, oh, Jesus must have loved Lazarus so much. Look at his tears. I think that's true. I think that's a valid thing for them to say. But, but can I draw an example of that for our life before God right now? Friends, catch this. If they looked at Jesus' tears and said, see how he loved him, and it was a valid thing to say, I can say with you with great confidence, Jesus has done much more for you than just weep. Jesus died for you. He went to the cross and bore all the sin and the shame that God the Father put upon him as a substitute in our place. Jesus faced back the powers of hell for you and I. He did it all. He did much more than weep. And so if they said how much he loved Lazarus because of his tears, what should we say because Jesus did much more than weep for us? We should be able to say, oh, see how he loves me. He loves me so much that he did all this for me. Verse 39. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Okay, sometimes we're so familiar with the Bible, we don't recognize how strange things are. Have you been to a lot of funerals, a lot of memorials? Have you ever been to a funeral memorial where the pastor says, pull out that coffin. Open that. You'd think the man's gone mad. What is he talking about? Well, they probably figured, they probably had no other way to explain it than other than just to think that Jesus wanted one last look at his dear friend Lazarus. He wasn't there when Lazarus died. He wasn't there when Lazarus was put in the tomb. And so they probably go, oh, sentimental Jesus. He just wants one last look, even though it's not going to be much to look at after four days in the tomb. But, but let's do it. Let's remove the stone, even though Martha protested, and I love how it's put in the King James Version, Lord, by this time, he stinketh. He smells. And in a culture like that, where there is no refrigeration, where it's a warm climate, it does not take long for the body to stinketh. So verse 40, Jesus says, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. I want you to understand this. Jesus did not tell Mary and Martha to believe as a precondition for Lazarus to be raised from the dead. He didn't say, if you believe, I'll raise him from the dead, but if you don't, well, then I'm not going to do it. No, no, that wasn't the case. Jesus had already determined that Lazarus was going to come out of that tomb. No, what Jesus determined right here is that their faith would enable them to see in a full way the glory of God in the matter. Friends, God can do a miracle right in front of your eyes, but without faith, you're not going to see his glory in it. That's what Jesus wanted them. Martha, Mary, believe and you will see the glory of God in this instance. That's what Jesus was encouraging her to do. 
So what did they do? Look at verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, now notice he's going to pray. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. All right, two things I want you to notice. First of all, look at verse 41 where it says, they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. Friends, in just a moment, Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. That is a pretty stupendous miracle, don't you think? Well, if Jesus could do that miracle, why couldn't he just miraculously move the stone away? Why not just like a Jedi thing, just whew, the stone's gone. Are you going to tell me that wasn't in the power of Jesus to do that? Or, or why couldn't Jesus just kind of have Lazarus materialize through the rock on the other side so they didn't even have to remove the stone at all? Friends, what I want you to grab a hold of is simply this, is that Jesus refused to do what they could do themselves. It was in their power to roll away the stone. So Jesus says, roll it away. It was not within their power to make Lazarus rise from the dead. So Jesus was going to do what he and what he alone could do. But I also want you to notice this prayer that Jesus prays. Did you notice in verse 41 that Jesus did not pray that the Father would raise Lazarus from the dead? Jesus prayed for everybody who was watching that they could see and understand and believe because of what he was about to do. Jesus did this. He did it with the authoritative word that he received from his Father. He did it within the Father's will, but he didn't pray for God the Father to do it. He did it as an exercise of Jesus' will in sync with the will of God the Father. So now verse 43, again, picture this in your mind. Are you ready for this? Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Do you see what's going on here? There's Jesus standing in front of the open tomb, and I don't know what kind of distance he's keeping. Again, the smell was pretty bad. Maybe he kept a healthy distance. He's kept his distance, and it says, verse 43, he cried with a loud voice, with authority. Jesus simply called Lazarus out of the tomb. You know, there's a few occasions before this in the Bible, in the Old Testament, where people are raised from the dead. But it was always done with elaborate prayers, with a lot of pleading, with a lot of trouble. Jesus didn't do any of that. Matter of fact, he doesn't even pray for Lazarus to be raised out of the tomb. He simply calls forth with the voice of authority, Lazarus, come forth. That's all he had to do. And Lazarus didn't. We don't know how it happened. I wonder what the experience was like for Lazarus. Maybe he was in some blessed place with the righteous dead. You know, maybe he's just enjoying a nice time. And then he hears a voice of authority. Lazarus, oh, that's me. Come forth. And then instantly, he's back there in the tomb. And the next thing you know, he's walking out of the tomb in obedience to the word of Jesus. I don't know exactly if that's how it happened, but it had to be something along those lines. But I do know this, that in John chapter 5, Jesus said that the day was coming when everyone who was in the grave would hear his voice, and when they heard his voice, they would raise from the dead and go to the resurrection, either the resurrection of the just or the resurrection of the condemnation. Jesus said everybody in the grave would hear his voice. It's as if he said this right here, right now. He said, I'm doing it right now just for Lazarus. One day it'll be for everybody, right now, just for Lazarus. Now, by the way, he did do it just for Lazarus, and some commentators point out that it was important that he said, Lazarus, come forth, because if he just would have said, come forth, that everybody dead in the graveyard would have come out. But no, he made it very clear. Lazarus, just you, only you, Lazarus. I'll get to the other ones later, but just you, Lazarus, now. Matter of fact, when he said that, Lazarus, come forth, one commentator said that the idea behind this could be par paraphrased, something like this. Lazarus, this way out. It's as if Jesus directed Lazarus out of a gloomy dungeon and it happened. Verse 44 says, he who had died came out. What must have that look like? This must look like a mummy movie. Lazarus comes teetering out of the grave in his grave clothes. And I don't know, maybe they wrapped him in a unique way. You know, normally they would bind the legs together when they wrapped somebody. I don't know if he hopped out like this. 
I don't know if they, in an unusual way, they wrapped him up. I don't know, but he was able to come out. And what a scene that must have been. What a smell it must have been. He comes out of the tomb and Jesus was able to resuscitate this dead body. And friends, this shows us something that's absolutely uh, positively true. It's that things that are unconquerable to us, they fall before Jesus Christ. Death is absolutely unconquerable. The, 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 the two things they say you can't avoid are death and taxes. But friends, you know this, that Jesus right here, he served notice to death. He said, death, I've got your number. Death, in just a matter of weeks, I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to rise from the dead. Death, I am going to defeat you. This is the trailer before the movie's released. I'm showing it right here that death, I have defeated you and you're dead and I'm going to do my work. What an amazing, glorious thing that Jesus said. That he was the resurrection and the life. And that he had this power over death. He said, listen, I am mightier than death. I can and I will defeat death. He shouted it out to every angel, to every demon, to every onlooking person that this was the case. Now, when Lazarus came out of the tomb, you noted that the condition he was in, it says in verse 44, his face was wrapped with a cloth. He was still in his grave clothes. There's a little bit of an interesting comparison between the resuscitation of Lazarus and the resurrection of Jesus. Friends, there's a difference between the two, and they're illustrated by the grave clothes. In other words, Lazarus wasn't resurrected, he was resuscitated. What's the difference? When you're resuscitated, you're going to die again. When you're resurrected, you never die again. When Jesus was resurrected three days after his crucifixion, he would never die again. That's why he left his grave clothes in the tomb. Won't need them anymore. Lazarus brought his grave clothes out of the tomb because you could say at least symbolically, metaphorically, he would need them again. By the way, it is said, and I can't prove it, but it is said that when ancient artists would paint a picture of Lazarus in this whole scene, they would always paint Lazarus with a sad face. Why? I can think of two reasons. One reason is, is he was in some blessed place in the world beyond and he had to come back. The second reason why Lazarus had a sad face was because he had to die again. And so how can you be happy knowing that you had to die again? Well, I don't know if that's true or not with the artist thing, but you get the, the idea there. He comes out in the grave clothes and then notice what it says there in verse 44. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Jesus did not miraculously remove the grave clothes from Lazarus, but he asked the people standing around to do it. In other words, Jesus did what only God could do, and then he looked for man's cooperation in the completion of the deliverance of Lazarus. In other words, Lazarus was completely alive, but he wasn't completely free. That had to come through a process of people working in his life. Friends, by analogy, that's just how it is in the spiritual life. When a person comes to Jesus, the Bible says that they pass from spiritual death to spiritual life. They become alive. That just as Lazarus was dead in the tomb and then became alive, so someone is spiritually dead and then in Jesus they become alive. But you know what? We come out of our tomb with grave clothes, don't we? We come out of our tomb smelling pretty bad sometimes. And what does God want to do? God, often working through others, gives us the freedom of removing the grave clothes, gives us a wash, and brings us into proper freedom among others again. I guess you could just draw a point of application to this that I would emphasize just for a moment at least. And the point is simply this. Don't live in your grave clothes. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're out of the tomb. Why do you live like a dead man? Why do you live after those things that Jesus has delivered you from? Man, that's all death. That old lifestyle, those old inclinations, that's dead and gone. Get those grave clothes off. And don't be surprised if God uses other people in your life to get those grave clothes off. That's just how it was with Lazarus. Going on now to verse 45. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did believed in 
him. Friends, you better believe they did. Of course they believed. You see a miracle like that right in front of your eyes, you say, okay, I get it. I had my doubts about this Jesus guy before, but now I saw what he did. I saw Lazarus. I was there. I saw the sights. I heard the words. I smelled the smells. It's a different man that came out of that tomb. Now, that's not the surprise. The surprise is in verse 46. Take a look. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. Many of those who saw this amazing miracle believed, but not everybody. Some used it to go and inform on Jesus to the religious leaders. They went and ratted Jesus out and the response of the religious leaders was, notice this, this guy Jesus is for real. We've got to do something about him. Friends, there's something very twisted in that, isn't it? Isn't it twisted to say what they said in verse 47? For this man works many signs. In other words, they privately admitted that Jesus performed the signs that proved him to be Messiah and God, but they would not put their trust in him. Why wouldn't they put their trust in him? Because putting your trust in Jesus is not just a matter of agreeing to facts. You think of a checklist in front of you. Uh, born in Bethlehem, check. Uh, lived a sinless life, check. Um, died on the cross, check. Raised from the dead, check. All right, good, I'm good. No, friends, it's not just a matter of believing facts about Jesus, even though you need to believe those facts and you need to trust in them. There is an element of surrender of life to Jesus. And these religious leaders knew the facts, but they would not surrender the life. God forbid that should be any of you. God forbid that anyone in this room would say, yeah, I get the facts about Jesus. Okay, yeah, he did this, this, this. Okay, I get it. But I will not surrender my life to him. Continuing on, verse 49. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that not the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but that he would also gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad." The high priest Caiaphas, he gave a prophecy without even knowing it. And the prophecy was simply this. You saw it there in verse 50. It is expedient for us that one man should die for the people. Well, that's true. One man was going to die for the people, but not in the way he meant it. In the way he meant it, it was, well, get this guy out of the way, and then we can keep doing our own thing. No, in the way that God meant it, one man was going to give his life as an atonement for sin for not only the Jewish people, but for all who would trust in him. As it says in that last verse that I read there, where it says, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Friends, that's me. I hope it's you. I hope it's you. I hope you're one of the children of God scattered abroad through the generations, through the geography, through the distance. You say, yes, I wasn't there in the first century when Jesus did all these things, but I put my trust in him. I surrender my life unto him. Verse 53. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near his wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. Friends, we're getting very close to the end now. So Jesus secludes himself for a short time so that his time would not be rushed and all things would happen according to God's timing. Finally, verse 55, and the Passover of the Jews was near and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think, that he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. We end John chapter 11 on the brink 
of the last week or so, maybe 10 days of Jesus' life before the cross. It is almost the Passover, that last Passover, where Jesus would lay down his life as a sacrifice of sin, as the ultimate Passover lamb. And the religious officials, they had their informants, they had their spies. Look for Jesus, find Jesus, we want to get Jesus. Notice what it says there at the very end in verse 57, that they might seize him in verse 57. Friends, I'll conclude with this point. It is a foolish thing to think that you can seize Jesus. Now, instead of seizing Jesus, no, let me put it this way. Instead of you catching Jesus, why don't you let him catch you? What do I mean by that? Look, for some of you, Jesus has been wrestling with you for a long time. Maybe about a general surrender of your life. You've never really given your life to Jesus. Maybe at a particular area. But Jesus has been wrestling with you for a long time. Why don't you today say, okay, Jesus, stop. I'll let you catch me. I'm not going to try to seize you. I'm going to let you catch me. There was an old English writer. I think it was Shakespeare, but I'm not sure. So don't quote me on that. But he called God the hound of heaven. I think, what a disrespectful thing for God to be called a hound, a dog. No, 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 the sense in that he meant it was the way that a hound pursues a hare or a fox, that's how God pursues people. Ladies and gentlemen, why don't you just stop and let Jesus catch you? Let him catch up to you. Just stop. Say, okay, Jesus, I surrender to you. Not just in the way of clicking off boxes of what I believe, but in a true surrender of life, as the religious leaders refuse to do, I will do. I will surrender my life unto you. Father, this is my prayer. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would move among people this morning. Simply, God, that we would give up trying to run from you and we would just sit still long enough for Jesus, you, to lay hold of us. So Jesus, I pray. I pray, Lord, um, that you would persuade hearts in the way that you can do that. Lord, it's not my intention this morning to talk anybody into anything. Lord, if I can talk them into it, someone else can talk them out of it. But I know, Jesus, that there's a way that you speak to the human heart. Sometimes you shout. Lord, I pray that maybe some spiritually dead people this morning would hear you shout, Lazarus, come forth. And that they'd receive life in Jesus' name. Do it, Lord, in our midst, we pray. Amen. Amen.